everyone, it's Pastor Brady. I am uh, excited for YC to start up in just a few weeks on August 7th at 6.30. I thought that it would be a good idea for us if we uh, dove back into the Word, it just even through video format, uh, just so I still knew how to teach and, and just so you kind of had an idea of, of what it looks like to dive into the Word. So uh, August 7th, uh, YC Kids, we are back in the book of Mark. We hope that you will be with us for that. So what I want to do right now is, is something a little bit different. Let's look at uh, the book of Psalms, specifically uh, Psalm chapter 16. Something that I don't think we, we think enough about is the fact that the book of Psalms uh, was the hymn book for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That, that, that the Psalms that we've had passed down now through centuries are, are the same Psalms that Jesus himself, Jesus and his disciples would sing. And so one thing that I love too about the book of Psalms is that it is a very uh, human book. You know, there, there, there's obviously there's moments of, of great desperation in the Psalms, but there's also great reminders of joy and encouragement. And, and, and what we're going to see through this Psalm that we're about to go through and, and really through the gospel is that while there is a burden that comes from the gospel, there's also a tremendous amount of relief. Now, I don't want to look at the gospel as burden in a negative way, but there's a weightiness to our lives with Christ. And, and you probably know the verse, Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then why would we do that? And he says, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So there's great hope in the gospel. There's great hope for, for any follower of Christ. And so what I want to do is look at this wonderful passage of hope, which is Psalm 16. And it's a hope that is based not on this life only, but it is a heavenly hope. And it is that hope that, that cannot be removed from us, and it's that hope that we have to cling to day after day day. Really, Psalm 16, it's a, it's a psalm by, uh, written by King David. It is an uh, outpouring of his soul to the Lord. And so it's very encouraging, regardless of what might happen in the future. This psalm is an excellent one to have in your tool belt, so to speak. And I, I would encourage you, uh, memorize it if you can, to think about it often. And, and, and I cannot even tell you just from my own experience how often uh, words of scripture have come to my mind when I'm in like a funk that have just completely turned turned my day around. So let's look at what David says here in Psalm 16. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to, to follow along, but here's what David writes in Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good beside you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have Bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my por or the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. So, what is it that David says of the Lord in these verses? Well, first off, David says that it is the Lord that he Please to. It is God that is David's refuge, but, but God is more than just a refuge for David. He is his Lord. It's as if David is saying, Lord, you are my master. You are the sovereign one of all creation, and you have taken an interest in me. Now, Christianity, I don't know if you knew this or not, but Christianity is the only religion in the world that I can think of where, where the God of that religion takes a personal and intimate interest in the individual. The God of Christianity is the only God that, that we can possess and desire that, that, that close of a relationship with us. 
David, as he goes on through the psalm, he says, I have no good beside you. And what this means for David is that everything in his life, everything in our lives, everything that is good is entirely dependent on the God who has shown and given us grace. If you look back on verses 3 through 4, David stresses the benefits of the faithful and the loss that will be found of those that are devoted to to other gods. And then, then a couple of verses later in verses 5 and 6, David points to how the Lord continually provides for him. Now, every basic need that David has, the Lord continually has provided for. Everything that he needed to worship him has been given to him. Now, if you were to stop right there and think about it, and you might disagree with me, but, but hear me out on this. If you have never lacked anything that has ultimately kept you from worshiping the Lord, everything that you have truly needed to worship God has been given to you. Now, this doesn't say everything that you've wanted, but every basic need that you've had or need, God has given to you, right? And, and, and so God has not kept anything, to my knowledge, that has kept me from desiring to worship him, right? Everything that I need to enjoy the Lord forever, he freely gives to us. Now, I may not have everything that I want in my life, but do I need those wants in order to worship the Lord? And this is an important question for, for you guys to think throughout the day. It's what is it that you really need to worship God? So like I said, not what do you want, what do you need? And I think, I'm, I'm pretty certain on this, that as you reflect on that, as you really take the time to think about it, you're going to see this. I've never lacked anything. I've never lacked anything, right? So verses 7 through 11, I really want us to, to take the time to look at these. Verse 7, if you're following along, we see that the Lord is the giver of wisdom. We serve a God that is able to be known. The Lord has given us his word so that we may know him better. Now, I know that I don't know everything about the Lord. It is not possible with my brain, with any human brain, to know everything about the Lord. I don't know everything about the Bible. I'm never going to know everything this side of heaven. But there's what we need to realize is that even though we may not know in full, there's nothing wrong. In fact, we're encouraged to ask for more wisdom so that we may know the Lord better, that, that he would make things clearer to us, that he would increase our wisdom. In the book of James, in James 1.5, James says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so notice, James does not say, look, if you lack material resources, if you lack wealth, just ask and God's going to give it to you. Right? No, James says, if you lack wisdom specifically wisdom if you if you feel like you don't know what you should if you do not have the wisdom that you would like to possess why be afraid to ask that god would reveal himself more to us we shouldn't be afraid to ask god for a greater increase of wisdom like right? we should ask him to reveal himself more clearly as we study his word so if you read your bible every single day and i really hope that you do what is it that you're hoping happens during that time as you study the Word? Now, are you just reading it to check something off of your to-do list? Or, or are you hoping to know the God that better, ins know God that inspired that book better? I don't know why that was so hard to say. Are you just doing it to check it off the list? Or do you do it hoping to meet the God who wrote the book himself? I know that for me personally, I don't want to put myself on a pedestal. I know for me personally that there are times when, when I do not read the Bible like I should. There are times where I, where I do it and I rush through it, not realizing that the great lover of my soul, my creator, is waiting to meet me in those pages. Now, Psalm 16, 8 through 11 are very, very important. And I want us to look there again. That's where I think we really see the encouragement that I mentioned earlier. So let's look at them again if you have your Bible. Uh, look at verses 8 and 11. David writes, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. 
You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now, what is it that David says there, and how does this connect to us? Really what David says here in verse 8 is the very same thing that Paul would go on to say later in Romans 8.31. What does Paul say there? He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? If God is at my right hand, what could possibly shake me in this world? David is saying God is unmovable. And because I'm his and he is mine, you know what? I'm unmovable too. In verse 10, David says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Uh, if you don't know what Sheol is, uh, Sheol was what the Jews referred to as, as the realm of the dead. And it was used to describe death for both believers and unbelievers. And what David is holding on to is what you and I need to hold on to as well. What hope is that? It's resurrection hope. How can David so confidently say that the Lord would not abandon his soul to death? Well, while he may not have seen the fullness of what he was saying, we can see the fullness of what, he, of what he was saying. How so? Well, we have the tendency to, as we read our Bibles, uh, to read backwards, or read the Bible back through the cross, which means we can clearly see what was only seen hazily in the Old Testament. If you've been to my Sunday school class, we, 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 we put it up on this board here. We put up... Uh, maybe you can see it. I don't know how well this is gonna gonna work, but uh, We have a timeline. Let's call it here So we have uh, the, the first day or, or we call this uh, Genesis chapter 1 we see uh, The grand scheme of things here of Revelation 22 we know it's gonna happen and here in the middle we have the cross and I don't even know if you can see it, but, but just kind of following along with it as we read the Bible we ultimately, because we're on this side of history, so to speak, whatever we read, we need to read it through the cross. We also need to read into the cross. So regardless of where we're going in this, we know that, that not everything that happens here before uh, the cross happens independently of what God is about to accomplish here. And everything that happens after the cross we can read back and see how it relates to the, the most central event in human history, the death, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So that, that was not planned. I don't know how this is going to look when I look. If, if there's a weird edit, it's because I realize how much I hate it. What I'm saying is that as we read our Bibles, we need to read it as with, with Christ as a central focus of it, which means that, that what Old Testament writers may have said here, hazily, gets greater fulfillment in what we, in a greater... Uh, what's the word? Greater... Yeah, come on. Uh, it becomes more clear because of what is accomplished here. Does that make sense? I hope it does. You're a video, uh, so you have to agree with me. As we... The, the reason really that, that David and all believers in Christ confidently know that God will not abandon them in death is because Christ, the Holy One, here was raised to life. And we know that where Jesus is, we will be also. That is how David could so certainly say this. It was because ultimately of what was going to happen on the cross and in the empty tomb. We can never be forsaken by our Heavenly Father because Jesus on the cross took all the forsakenness that you deserve, that I deserve, and, and took it on himself. That is the reason that we have hope. The reason that Christians die well is because we have the unwavering hope that just as God has not abandoned us in life, he will not abandon us in death either. And really, the Christian will be more alive in, in, at the end of his earthly life than he was during it. And I, I heard, I forget if it was R.C. Sproul or Tim Keller, who it was, I, whoever said it, I think it was Tim Keller now that I think about it, he said of heaven that if we only knew what awaited us in heaven, that perfect joy that was to come, we would not even bother looking across the street for cars when we walk across it. We wouldn't bother looking both ways as we cross the street. That is how glorious the future hope of heaven is. C.S. Lewis, he said that they say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it, not knowing that heaven once attained will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. It's the assurance of future glory that will get you through not just today, but every day between now and eternity. So do you have the hope of heaven? Because if your eyes are set on the king, it doesn't matter what's happening in the courts. Thomas Brooks was an old Puritan. He said that hope can see heaven through the thickest clouds. 
And if you have the same exact confidence that David has here uh, in, in, in Psalm 16, you're going to have a, a living hope. If you have a living hope and a living Savior, you can go through anything in this life just as David does in Psalm 16. So do you have that hope? Do you possess it? Because ultimately man needs something to put his hope in. But that hope, it needs to be something that cannot be swayed. True hope needs to be in something that is certain. And where else can this be than in the God that never changes? We need a hope in something that is ultimately outside of us and more sure than us. So do you, do you real quick, just sort of put it all together. Do you know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, at the end of, or in the middle of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 19 through 28? We'll end with this. This is what Paul says. He says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is expected who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all in all. See, there is our living hope. There's our heavenly reward, knowing that one day that it will be seen in full. Every little thing will be seen clearly subjected to Christ. One day we're going to see that happen. We're going to be with the one who was and is and is to come. So, as you uh, go about your day, really, where is your hope at? Is it a heavenly hope or is it an earthly one? Because if it is not a heavenly hope, I don't know how you're going to get through the day. You might be able to find a way. You might find something to hold on to. You might have something that encourages you throughout the day. But eventually when that fades, what are you going to hold on to? So that is everything that I have for us today. Again, this was really just kind of almost a commercial of, hey, uh, we hope to see you back for YC, for my middle and high schoolers, uh, Wednesday, August 7th at 6.30. Uh, we hope that you've had a great summer. We hope that uh, this has been beneficial to you. And uh, we will hopefully also see you at Sunday school, 10 o'clock, here at Olive Branch. But uh, that is that. And if we don't see you at, at, at Sunday school, we will see you on August 7th.